when I was in the 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 when I I was laying there, uh, practically naked, and I had her hold me as if I was naked. I couldn't talk, I couldn't open my eyes, I, I believe my eyes were rolling back in my head. There was evidence of human sacrifice on this fight. One of my first questions I asked the guy, was there evidence of human sacrifice? Now, what's around there? Yes, we found the man with his fingers sliced off. Alright guys, welcome back to Conspira Normal. It's only been about a week, but here we are in the ever-changing weather world that is Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, two days ago, it was like 40-something degrees, and actually the day before that, it was 20 degrees. It rose slightly up to about 70 yesterday and then the rain came through and now it's back down into the 20s and the 30s which was awesome because we went straight from tornado warnings to freezing rain warnings in right. a matter of hours right yeah how, how does that happen <laughs> only in tennessee apparently that's what they say about tennessee weather if you wait a bit it'll change but uh it, if you if anyone does not notice this is wrecked hell on my sinuses the last few days i have some kind of sinus infection so Right now, I sound like what's that character, the, the cartoon character that uh, had like the no, the nose infection all the time, Mister Magoo or whatever. <laughs> That's what I think I feel like. Was it droopy, droopy dog? or Chili Willy the Penguin? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah something like droopy that. Dog. <laughs> Uh, we got well, uh, to <laughs> <laughs> well guys if you have a guest we have our guest already on the line and that is someone that uh we've had on the show before uh, but also i've had the privilege since then of sitting in with him on a where did the road go round table I think that was with you and Soraya, of course, and Aaron David. I think that's right, at the end of mm-hmm. October. And that is Joshua Cutchin, or as I like to refer to him, the Cutch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be here, man. And I think that after Micah Hanks, you are the 14 slash podcast personality slash et cetera, et cetera, that I've actually hung out with in yeah. my meat suit. The most, so. Yeah, yeah, we uh, a couple of times I've been down. I said you don't live too far from us. You're down there in the, in the Atlanta area, and I have a good friend that lives down there. So uh, we've gotten together a couple of times. Uh, this uh, what was it? The end of October was the last time that I saw you. Uh, yeah, sounds about right. right. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we were we were having our pre-election <laughs> lamentations. Uh, yeah, at the Georgia Diner of all places, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, last time, you know, I was listening to the show that we did about Trojan Feast, and last time you were, I think, at the point of sending this book to the publisher. And this book is similar in a way to Trojan Feast in that you look at a particular aspect of Fortiana, uh, unexplained phenomenon, unexplained experiences, and that would be smells. And the title of the book is The Brimstone Deceit. But before we kind of get into the title, why you you picked that one particularly, uh, what brought you to write a book about smell specifically and what is it about the smells that you talk about that it, that intrigued you to write about this well um you know as i went through a trojan feast it became 
more and more apparent that there were certain aspects of the unexplained in general that people just have wanted to leapfrog over. They haven't eaten their vegetables. They haven't eaten their broccoli. Um, they didn't really take, as a community, the time to sit down and, and really look at some of these small details and see if perhaps there might be some sort of revelation in these in these facts. Um, so I sort of that's sort of what I hope to be my credo from from here on out is to really look at these tiny things that people have deemed inconsequential because I think if you look at that, you can at least at least gain some extra insight into these phenomena as a whole. If not, I mean, who knows, maybe someday the answer to such things might lie in these tiny little details. Um, so the biggest target really was um, was the food taboo, which is what I covered in a Trojan feast, which was something that like nobody had ever really talked about. Um, but uh, on the flip side, you know, the smell thing, uh, the, the role of smell in paranormal slash supernatural encounters, um, it's something that had gotten some attention here and there, like a chapter devoted here or there, but nobody had ever sat down with all the data and really tried to put it all together to see if some sort of trends emerged from that. So I decided that it was a, a, a logical next step. You know, that in addition to the fact that, you know, smell and taste are closely linked, and I was already doing some research sure. along those lines anyway. So, uh, yeah, it was just sort of a seemed to me like um, something that was co- was was calling out to be studied. Um, on on the other hand, you know, um, on the other hand, there I feel like I covered a majority of the food interactions in a Trojan feast between you know aliens, fairies, and Sasquatch with witnesses in um, in this book, like. I did my best to collect as many as I could, but uh, I think I just scratched the surface because smell is such a such a present uh, sense, you know, something that just comes to us unbidden. It's not like it's it only happens in a handful of cases; it happens in a lot of cases. So, yeah. trying to find my way through that to get sort of like a a real a real sense of what the most common smells were was quite a challenge. And in this book, uh, you do kind of a little bit of opposite, I noticed, that you did in Trojan Feast. And that is you have – in Trojan Feast, you focus on fairies. uh, You focus on food and UFO events. And there is a Sasquatch section, but it's not as long. In this book, there's a lot more about Sasquatch, Bigfoot – and really, fairies, there's not as much as dealing with smell, but you do also focus on the spirit. So there's a little bit of a you have, I like your opposite take that you do in this book as opposed to the, to the last one. Right. You know, I'm a big fan of fairy lore because I think that it I think that fairy lore actually encompasses a lot more of Fortiana than we want to acknowledge. Like if you look at the way that Sasquatch accounts uh, unfold. If you look at the way that certain spirit accounts unfold, the way that certain alien accounts unfold, they all have things that appear in fairy lore. So I'm a big fan of looking at fairy lore. The problem yeah. is you don't really find a lot of stuff that involves smells with fairies. Now, you know, having said that, um, one of the last chapters of the book is talking about like everything else. So I do go into the smell of fairies, the smell of lake monsters, the smell of them black, the smell of um, dog man, chupacabras, every, everything else that I could get my hands on, basically. Um, but yeah, so for this, the, the three most common groups of of entities that you could attribute smells to were Sasquatch, uh, UFOs slash extraterrestrials, and uh, and spirits. Um, and the spirits thing, the, the ghosts, I say spirits, is sort of a catch all because they bring in demons and Marian apparitions. So I think that's a little bit more of a broader term than ghosts. Um, sure. The spirit thing. Actually, I'm not really that interested in ghosts and spirits. Hmm. And like, in terms of like, in terms of. <sighs> Doing stuff in the field, it's probably my source of, of the most interest that I have, but just because it's something that's very, um, it's really quite approachable. Um, but uh, in terms of in terms of like just reading about them and, and lore and stuff, I'm more interested in the other the other categories because there's so much there really is so much garbage in ghost lore. You know these stories about you know the, these urban legends that have been handed down about a guy losing his head on the tr- on the railroad tracks or whatever. Um, so it's really an area that I'm less less interested in. But what's interesting is that there was actually a wealth of data here. So I decided to go ahead and include this um, in in the uh, in, this, in this in this book because it really was a, a rich vein of speculation. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> there is a lot written about that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the choice of the title, Brimstone Deceit, because you kind of make a joke that uh, people would look at this and think that this is kind of like a Christian-themed book. 
<laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think I told you when we uh, did that round table, I told you L.A. Marzulli wanted his title back. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's kind of funny because I have, I have talked on various podcasts about being a Christian, so I'm, I'm sure that there are some people out there who are like, oh, he's gone and written the brimstone deceit. It's about... <laughs> It's about devils and Satan interfering with our lives, but no, yeah. it's, it's not really. Um, so one of the most common things that happened to uh, that happened to emerge when looking at all the data was that the smell of brimstone, the smell of sulfur, or more specifically, sulfur compounds, is one of the most common smells that you find in paranormal uh, activity cases. Um, and it's it's almost like a Rorschach test for the way that people feel in terms of the way that they will react to that. Like a lot of people will hear that and they'll go, oh, it's all demons. Um, but the people that I want to hang around with are the ones who say, that's interesting. It's interesting that it you know, folds in that sort of demonic lore. But what does it say about the, these phenomena in general? And it's really surprising to see that you find the smell of sulfur in – um, you know, demonic activity. You find it in uh, a lot of Bigfoot activity. People don't, aren't necessarily aware of that. You find it in a lot of um, in a lot of UFO and extraterrestrial activity, and again in all those other categories that I mentioned, like uh, chupacabras, Men in Black. Uh, uh, um, not specifically like monsters, but in some fairy encounters too. So it really is suggestive that there is some sort of again suggestive that there is some sort of underlying commonality to a lot of these experiences. Um, so when, 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 when looking at that data point, you have to break it apart and, and try to figure out exactly what people mean. Um, you know, a lot of these, the, the, the general term sulfur can mean a variety of compounds. And that's where a lot of the book does focus its, uh, its, its, its length. But at the same time, um, you know, this is not just about sulfur. I mean, there are other smells that I go into in the book uh, that, uh, that are completely different than sulfur. So trying to find a way that those smells and the, um, the, the smell of sulfur could coexist in a continuum that perhaps somehow has some sort of balance or some sort of play in it was part of the challenge of the book. So, uh, yeah. So in summary, a lot of sulfur in the book, but also a lot of other smells as well. Well, let's 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 focus on sulfur for a little bit because you do bring up some interesting points in the book, and especially in in the introduction where you're talking more scientifically. Um, I had no idea, but I guess it makes sense to me since reading it that we do tend to be very sensitive to sulfur in our environment. Like we could smell it. Like we are, we are almost designed to smell sulfur. It's kind of strange oh, yeah, how so. strong that that is in innately strong it is in human beings from some of the data, some of the research that you cite in the book. So, what's you know what compounds are we actually dealing with when we when we say the word sulfur? Yeah, it's funny. Like if 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 for as secretive as these phenomena seem to want to be yeah it uh, they definitely if if they're choosing what they smell like they couldn't have chosen something worse is what i always say because it's we are hardwired to notice sulfur the thing is um that is that uh, sulfur in its pure form does not smell it only smells in a variety of sulfur compounds so if it's burnt it creates uh sulfur dioxide so2 um, which is the sort of smell that you associate with fireworks or gun or burning gunpowder. Um, and uh, if it, uh, if uh, organic material decays in the absence of oxygen, such as in a swamp or in rotten eggs or in yes, your intestinal tract, um, that produces hydrogen sulfide H two S. What is interesting to me is that, especially with hydrogen sulfide, you will find that the human sensitivity to hydrogen sulfide is among the most uh, minute of amounts for us to, in, to to detect any sort of any sort of amount of compound. So to put this in perspective, if I were to have a tanker truck, like a semi tanker used to haul you know water or milk or something, a tanker truck's uh, tank, a tank on a big big semi trailer. Um, if I took a an ink dropper and dropped one drop of ink into a, into a big tanker truck full of water, that would be twice the concentration at which we can smell sul- hydrogen sulfide in our hmm. environment. Um, hmm. One part per billion is actually the the threshold for for detection. So really, it's, it's it, yeah, it's it's almost like it's again, it's almost like it's like it's, it's tailor picked to be the most uh, noticeable compound in these encounters. And hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide are two of the hmm. most common uh, compounds in a lot of these encounters. From what I can, you know, from what I can 
uh, parse out. You know, a lot of times you'll have people in these matters who say, I, it, it smelled like sulfur. Well, as I just said, sulfur doesn't smell. So what does that mean? Sometimes the witnesses will, you know, sort of uh, elaborate on that and they'll say, well, it smelled like rotten eggs. And that's, you know, you know, it's exactly what uh, sulfur sure. is. Or, you know, if they say it smelled like uh, household gas, like cooking gas, natural gas, well, natural gas do- actually does not have a scent to it. It's actually uh, has uh, what are called mercaptans or thiols, which are sulfur compounds that are added to the natural gas uh, so that they'll be noticeable to human beings. Right, because again, we're so sensitive to sulfur. So really, it's 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 one of these things where you're dealing with a lot of witness accounts that seem to indicate that sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide are the most common uh, or olfactory compounds that people notice in these encounters. In any of your research, Josh, do you do, did you come across to to the reason, maybe like an evolutionary reason that we would be so sensitive to that? <laughs> Well, you know, in general, it's – well, specifically hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is uh, quite toxic in significant amounts. I mean, it's sort of – so to, to sort of clarify that statement a little bit, technically any any gas other than our mixture of oxygen is, is, is deadly in certain amounts because you're not getting – uh, oxygen, but hydrogen sulfide has actually been used as a chemical warfare agent. So uh, it seems that perhaps evolutionarily we evolved to detect hydrogen sulfide specifically at such low thresholds because we would encounter it in our day-to-day environment. Um, you, know, you would encounter it around volcanic sites, certain pockets in uh, caverns and caves. You would also run into this this gas uh, emanating. So. Yeah. Um, supposedly, that's the answer. You know, hydrogen sulfide has been blamed for some mass extinctions in the past. Um, I believe the Permian extinction, if memory serves off the top of my head, um, was a mass extinction that was attributed to, 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 to too much uh, hydrogen sulfide in the air. Um, but it doesn't really explain why we're sensitive to sulfur in general, because even though we're hypersensitive to hydrogen sulfide, we are sensitive to sulfur compounds in general, and sulfur is one of the most common elements in the universe. That's it's actually, true. It's actually, um, you know important to have in your body you know um we are the sulfur in our body often manifests not only is it important to live but it also manifests in your body in the form of uh, hair and fingernails um similar mm. to the way that sulfur is used to vulcanize rubber uh, to give it that sort of strength that's the same reason that your hair and your fingernails are pliable is that sort of keratin sulfur balance that you get as well so um it seems like, yeah, we should have evolved to be sensitive to it, but to the degree we are sensitive is, is, is quite striking. Let's talk a little bit about some of the science behind smell. And two things that uh, I'm particularly interested in is this the defining the term hedonic. And also, you also, through the book, you use the term tip of the nose phenomenon. What do those two things mean? Yeah, so uh, hedonics are generally a description of the pleasant or unpleasant nature of smell. So we assume that a lot of things are – we assume that human beings share certain attributes uh, in terms of what they deem a pleasant smell or an unpleasant smell. But that's actually not the case. It's very culturally based. Um, It's one of the reasons that no one has ever been able to weaponize smell as as the military would like to have done. Having said that, if there is a smell that is the closest to being a universally reviled smell, it is most likely – a sulfur compound of some sort. Um, but a lot of these hedonic values are, like as I mentioned, uh, really ascribed to us by our culture. Um, so in other words, uh, if people, if you're a garbage man, garbage smells like money. If you're a vegan, vegan smell, be- vegan. If you're a vegan, bacon smells like death. Mm-hmm. As opposed to me, you know, I think bacon is great. Um, oh, who does? So it's, 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 who it's, doesn't? It's, I mean, like, come on. Poor vegans. I, I've met some people. I've met some people. Um, but, uh, it really is this sort of learned, learned association between smell and the emotion that it elicits, um, where this is interesting in terms of the, uh, in terms of the paranormal is that sometimes people will see an object in the sky and they won't have the fear reaction until they smell it. It'll actually sort of pair up with them and give them a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a sense that something is, is not quite as it should be when they smell a foul smell. Um, so that's the general idea behind hedonics. The other idea that, that you mentioned is the tip of the nose, which is a play on the tip of the tongue phenomenon. It's part of the reason, I think, why no one has ever written a book like this before is because you have a lot of people who um, will smell something in an encounter and be unable to place exactly what it smells like. It's very um, it's very familiar to them. Smell is 
intimately tied to, mem- to memory, and we can talk about that if you want to in a little bit. But a lot of times people will remember a smell, and they'll be able to describe the smell, but they won't be able to pinpoint exactly what it is. And that's what the tip of the nose phenomena is. And you run into this a lot of times when people don't say, you know, it smelled like, um, you know, it smelled like, let's use, let's use nonsense, for example. It smelled like, uh, it's like cinnamaldehyde. They'll say it smelled like, you know cinnamon <laughs> you know they won't they won't pinpoint the exact the exact uh, scent that, that is the reason for or even right. not being able to say even in that case if they were trying to describe cinnamon they might say it smelled spicy kind of like christmas like they wouldn't be able to actually put it on put you know put the label on it um and it's a it's a confounding factor in, in the research for sure um it's something that you sort of have to wade your way through so it could smell like cinnamon but it is it may not actually be cinnamon that's right. what we're and, saying. And, yeah. Yeah, exa- exactly. And, and, you know, a good example of this, and for example, why this is so problematic is that our scent is uh, reinforced, our sense of olfaction is reinforced with, um, with other sensory data. So if, if you want to ever, you know, sort of examine how this unfolds, take a piece of Parmesan cheese and put it under someone's nose while they're blindfolded and tell them that you're having Italian and they're going to be excited. But do the same to take that same course of action and tell them that someone just puked and they're going to have a different reaction because you know there are similar compounds in both of the you know in in in, in you know stomach acid and in in pizza, um, uh-huh. or specifically the cheese in the pizza um, that we don't really know how to react to it unless we have some other stimuli. Yeah, there's a com- there's a commercial I think for like an air freshener that is very similar to what you just described where they take these people and they blindfold them and they take them to like some nasty ass apartment, you know, and there, yeah. and there's like dead, yeah, there's like has, dead things. Has. And they, they spray, they spray this air freshener and they're like, where are you right now? And they're like, we must be in a garden full of wonderful roses. And they, they <laughs> I love take, those commercials. <laughs> they take off the, the blindfold and it's, and it's, you know, the terrible apartment with roaches crawling on the floor, you know, <laughs> And, you know, that's an interesting example because you'll find even when people do have data that perhaps represents otherwise, smell will still influence them in ways that they don't realize. Um, studies have shown that a, um, a, an office building that smells like cleaning supplies, like it's been freshly cleaned, mm-hmm. will make people more lenient in business dealings. Um, so you have this sort of interaction between our minds and, 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 and smell that um, if – there were an intelligence of some description, and you know me, I'm not a big ETH guy, but right. if there were an intelligence of some description that has the ability and the interest in, man- in manipulating witnesses, it is a sense that is absolutely ripe for, for manipulation in that, in that way. So, you mm-hmm. know, hence the Bridgestone deceit, the idea that people are being manipulated uh, to the intelligence's wishes by, um, by olfaction. You know, reading this uh, book, especially the first part, you know, I kind of realized just how much we do really rely a lot on our sense of smell as an animal that compared to like cats or dogs that we don't have as great a sense of smell as they do, but we still rely on it pretty well. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, I have sort of wondered if perhaps um, – all paranormal, um, all paranormal phenomena uh, tend to s- emit some sort of smell. It's just that human beings don't always notice it. Sometimes it's so minute that we don't notice it, but our pets might notice it, which is why they might they might be staring at the corner of you know corner of your room in your haunted house because even though you don't see anything, maybe they don't see anything either, but they definitely smell something. That's mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so if you're to look at sort of the to put in perspective, I mean, a cat's sense of smell is, some people have said, like 13 to 15 times greater than the human sense of smell. But to sort of put this in perspective, like your dog, someone once said that uh, humans wake up and they open their eyes. A dog wakes up and it takes a, takes a smell because right. that's really the way they interact with the world. Um, though it varies from breed to breed, uh, uh, dog senses of smell are 10 to 100,000 times as acute as human senses of smell, which is ridiculous. I have the quote in the book. Um, from uh, this, this just uh, doctor by the name of uh, Walker from Florida State University who says that if we ju- assume that the, the low end of that spectrum, so just 10,000 times better than us, um, if you make that analogy to vision, what human beings could see at a third of a mile, a dog could see at 3,000 miles away. 
So it's not yeah. even the hundred thousand mile spectrum. So it's 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 such a robust smell, especially in canines, um, that I wonder again, like perhaps everything smells, and perhaps all ghosts emit some sort of smell, and that's why you get these animals that seem to have the sixth sense. It's not really that they can see something or that they have the sensation of something; they're just smelling something right there in front of them. Right, because it, it may seem mysterious to us, but to them. It it is it may be just completely normal. It's just because it, their senses are so much more acute than ours. And fun yeah, fact: it's, it's, the longer mm-hmm. their snout is, the better their sense of smell is. That's why a lot of hunting really? dogs and things like that they always have longer snouts. It yeah. doesn't really pertain, but it's just a fun fact. No, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's interesting. That is interesting because there isn't really a correspondence between you know. Uh, Actually, you know what? That's an interesting question that is brought up. Do human beings have a more robust sense of smell with hooded nostrils than uh, than apes do? I don't. I didn't necessarily stumble across that in my research, but that's something that yeah. would be interesting to look into. Well, I guess pugs are just screwed then, aren't they? Because they have no smell. <laughs> they can barely breathe, let alone smell. <laughs> Bulldogs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into some of the more specific encounters. And so let's start off with the spirit smells because this is this is some interesting stuff. And of course, you know, I've heard this over and over again. If you watch any of the ghost shows, you know, they always talk about the uh the cig- you know, the cigar smells, the uh perfume smells, these kind of things. But uh, what types of smells are usually associated with these spirit encounters? What what do we get when we're dealing with people that are having quote unquote spirit encounters? Well, you know, the short answer is any and everything. Um, You know, a a lot of anything that had a strong association with someone during their life, if we are to assume that ghosts are the spirits of the dead, which I have a little bit of a, not a problem with, but I'm a little bit hesitant to, to jump on that bandwagon. If we assume that, then anything that anybody any sort of odor that was important to people earlier in their life while they were alive um, can manifest itself in, in the afterlife and in, in sort of the, the, the spirit world and haunting. Having said that, there are certain motifs that you do encounter here and there. Um, the most common, I would say, are floral slash perfume scents for female spirits or what are perceived as female spirits. And uh, tobacco slash smoke smells for male spirits. Um, what's interesting to me is if you sort of break that down and look at the assumptions therein, it seems like a very, not even 20th century. There, there's some interesting assumptions in within that, that I, I have, I do have problems with because, you know, uh, you know, men have used cologne since antiquity and women have smoked uh, just as much as men in years past. So it's interesting that as a, as a ghost hunting society, you smell, you know, if someone smells tobacco, it must be a male ghost. They right, smell a cigar. right. Right. Um, I think that goes are, into that hedonic uh, association, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but those are some of the most common smell and you'll find like it's, 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 um, it's it's such a robust motif that if anyone who's listening will probably be able to find a location within 30 miles of their house where there is a ghost that smells like perfume or or cigars, you know, or cigarettes, um, perfume or smoke. Um, you know, it's 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 something that occurs in in so many cases. Um, and uh, it's interesting too if you look at the sort of the the feminine side of the equation. Um. That also uh, dovetails nicely with the smells that are reported in apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which I sort of include in the spirit category. Um, supposedly, uh, Mary always, always not only com- accompanied by a floral scent, but it's sometimes accompanied by literal rose petals or, or literal flower petals that uh, tend to manifest around her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, d- that's some fascinating stuff, and we'll we'll get into that. <laughs> And another yeah, yeah. another thing here, exactly. but uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that I think that you point out in the book is that you do have sometimes in environments, and especially in an old building where people probably smoked constantly, that you are going to have these. It's going to be maybe permeated through the walls or through the, the just the atmosphere, uh, and also I think probably the. Perfume would be also another one. So how do we differentiate between that and an actual kind of spirit smell that just comes out of nowhere? 
Yeah, that's part of the reason that this entire section of the book ended up being a little bit more problematic than I would have liked because um, with you know UFOs and extraterrestrials and Bigfoot and all the other categories that I go into, people see an entity and they smell something. But with a lot of these hauntings, uh, there is a tradition of people who just happen to smell something out of you know out of, out of out of nowhere without any sort of corresponding entity. And what that leads to is it leads to a lot of inflation. Um, there was an example that I cited in the book of a family who always smelled. Um, I believe it was uh, either a perfume or a cologne. And what they discovered is that um, this was sort of linked to times of year. And when they looked at the times of year, they found out that it was whenever the hearth was being used, whenever there was a fire in the fireplace. And what would happen is that uh, at some point someone had presumably spilled um, perfume onto the mantle and it had soaked into the wood. And whenever the wood would expand, it would actually sort of release the smell into the cottage. So the cottage mm-hmm. wasn't actually haunted by somebody. It was just, you know, this smell that was hanging around. Similarly, um, some ghost hunters have talked about phantosmia, which is there are certain, there are certain neurological conditions um, associated with smell that are usually uh, neurologically related to um, uh, for example, uh, anosmia is the inability to smell. Phantosmia is the smelling of um, phantom smells, and cacosmia is the interpretation of pleasant smells as unpleasant. The um, phantosmia is actually a very uh, well recognized medical condition, and it's usually symptomatic of either uh, you know uh, uh, something like a stroke or a, a, a brain tumor or something. The problem is that the ghost hunting community has, a, has said phantosmia means a phantom smell. Yeah. Let's set, set the record straight here. That's not what that means. If you have like three people in the same room and they're all smelling the same smell, that's not phantosmia. It can't be because phantosmia is a, you know, a, a one person, one brain sort of neurological condition. Someone that has a so, medical condition. Yeah. Right. But what this does bring into question is people <clears throat> who are alone who smell something is that an example of some sort of phantosmia, which can happen for non neurological reasons as well. Um, so, yeah, the whole, the whole ghost smell thing is is really uh a a bit of a tangled web unless you have multiple witnesses and you're seeing an entity as well um because there are no, a number of environmental factors i mean uh it's um uh, one of the reasons that i think it was kind of cool that the guys on taps uh, in on uh, ghost adventures or ghost hunters i can't even remember what the show was now um some of them were uh, actually i believe trained plumbers is because they could go in there and they could you know find out if there's a leaky a leaky drain because sometimes sewer gas will fit through the drain. And what does sewer gas smell like? Well, it smells like sulfur. Right. Exactly. So you can have people you can have people who, you know, might have that sort of a problem or another example that I cite in the book, some people who were sitting across a fault line that would expand whenever it rained and would actually vent some, some uh, sulfur dioxide into their home. They assumed that they were being visited by the, by Satan. No, it was just gas. <laughs> it was just gas from underground. Um, so yeah. So, oh, it's uh, the demons. All right. It's, but it's, it's got to be a demon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, so there are, there are there are a number of reasons that uh, spirit sightings and smells can be problematic. Having said that, plenty of uh, examples where uh, rooms full of people will smell um, will smell perfume or smoke, and without any sort of seasonal rhyme or reason. Um, there are times when people will smell other smells as well. I mean, there's an example that I have in the book of a. Uh, a theater in, I believe it was Missouri. I'm not sure if that's correct off the top of my head, but um, a theater where an individual had used uh, prior to every performance, he'd use a certain face cream and the smell of that face cream mm-hmm. would still manifest itself. And, um, it, it, the, the actual brand of face cream had actually been uh, banned by the theater because of this recurring smell that kept on happening. Um, because of the, the, the gentleman had, uh, had I believe he committed suicide in the theater, I think. Um, so, yeah, so there are a variety of smells, but you can only really put a bunch of stock in them unless, you know, either A, someone's seeing something, or there are multiple people who are you know, experiencing it at the same time. Where do the sulfur smells come in in the um, spirit uh, section? What's, uh, what, what, uh, where, do those, where does that part, uh, what would be a good example of that, people smelling the sulfur? Right. Well, the, the, the most apparent and obvious thing is examples of, um, of demonic interaction. So a lot of times in possession cases, you'll have people who will smell like this burnt sulfur smell or a burnt rubbery sulfur smell, um, uh, possession or, you know, infestations in a household. Um, but what's interesting is that you also find it, <clears throat> excuse me, 
You also find it in a handful of cases that are explicitly non-demonic. But in every one of those cases, you will find that the uh, entity associated with it is is usually malevolent. Um, so again, it's a hedonic association. Smells bad is bad. Um, so you'll find, for example, there is the a story of um, a story of this gentleman in I believe it's Manitou Springs, Colorado, um, who is called the Eggman. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's an urban legend. I'm not sure if it's real or not, but it's it's really exemplary of sort of this theme. Um, and supposedly he finds people wandering through the streets at night and accosts them and beats them with his cane. And he leaves them, <laughs> he leaves them, he leaves them smelling like, like rotten eggs. <laughs> um, and there's supposedly there's a story behind it where there was a guy who walked into a saloon with a, you know, a basket full of eggs and shot himself in the temple. But it's interesting that that's a non, that example is of a non demonic entity, just a malevolent haunting, if you were, um, who uh, tends to still manifest this hydrogen sulfide smell, this rotten egg smell. So while it's often tied to demonic activity, it can often be tied. It can also be tied rather um, to um, to entities that are just uh, sort of negative in general. So the question is, to me at least, um, why is there that degree of consistency? You know, I know lots of people who smell great. Lots of bad people who smell great. <laughs> I know lots sure. of good people who lots of good people who smell bad. So if we if we literally want to make this assumption that something in life carries through to death, that doesn't quite seem to be accurate enough for me, you know. There's one uh that you mentioned in the book that is uh from the set of the night of the film Gettysburg that was done on the actual battlefield itself, and I thought this was interesting. Because you can almost you can explain the sulfur smell in this one. Yeah, it's, it was really interesting. So um, Gettysburg was um, the first time that the Park Service actually allowed a production of a historical event in cinema to take place on the actual battlefield. So they actually filmed it at Gettysburg, um, and they had Civil War reenactors sort of filling out the uh, extras in the army um, armies rather. And according to one story of some of these extras on set, there were killing time between you know between shots because there's a lot of time to kill on movie sets, and uh, they were they were sort of just sitting around and a Union soldier or a guy who came in a Union outfit came up through the through the brush and uh, said that they they said that he smelled strongly of sulfur, um, handed them you know some musket balls here and there and said you know we had a rough one today guys didn't we, and then he disappeared. And they, they they took a look at that, and they you know they tried to they looked for him for the rest of the production, could never find this guy, and they took the musket balls to a an appraiser in Gettysburg, and they were deemed authentic. They were actually deemed 130 years old. So, hmm. um, what's interesting is that you know, um, sulfur, a quote unquote generic smell of sulfur, is often associated with battlefields. The reason that that assumption is made is because uh, sulfur dioxide is one of the uh, one of the primary odiferous byproducts of um, gunpowder, especially right. black powder. Right. Um, so th- there is a sense that um, that even though there wasn't a demonic association with this particular you know person, that is something that might have carried through from their from from their life, you know, because they would have smelled like gunpowder. And people will still go to certain civil war sites, especially in America, and smell gunpowder. Um, you know, while there is uh, black powder and and gunpowder used in certain civil war reenactments. It's an example of something that should not cling to the environment, like in houses. Like you know, it, I don't care. You know, let's say that there are. Let's let's be generous and say that there is a reenactment once a month at Gettysburg. That shouldn't be enough to make people going. You know, three weeks later, uh, there shouldn't be enough to make people who go three weeks later smell gunpowder in the air. You know, right? Um, so it does suggest that there's some sort of actual actual paranormal activity that's manifesting itself as a smell in those cases. <laughs> You do something interesting in the section on spirit smells, and you talk about uh, well, one of our favorite subjects, sleep paralysis, and some of the smells that are associated with the old hag syndrome. What are some of those? Because you don't, I, I usually don't hear about the smell aspect in that experience. No, no, uh, people don't usually talk about it, but there is a degree of consistency in old hag attacks. Um, so. Uh, more often than not, when people have sleep paralysis associated with an old hag event, which is the sensation of pressure on the chest, they'll notice a musty or dusty or moldy sort of smell, um, like one would equate with an attic or something. Um, I did find a case of a gentleman who had an old old hag attack and said that it smelled like a musty, 
hotel room that smelled like cigarettes or something along those lines. Um, so it's interesting that there would be that sort of a connection, especially considering that science doesn't really acknowledge that you can smell in dreams. Um, science acknowledges that dreams can affect smell. So if you're, if somebody comes along and uh, waves something odiferous, something foul in front of your nose while you're asleep, but it can actually give you nightmares. But science doesn't say that you can actually smell something in your dreams. People say that they can, but science hasn't, hasn't really acknowledged that as a, as a possibility. Um, but what's interesting about the similarities between uh, the smells of the old hag and the alien abduction experience is that a lot of times the inside of craft and alien abduction experiences um, do have this sort of musty smell. It's one of, it's one of the smells that Whitley Strieber mentioned um, in communion is that the inside of the craft sort of smelled musty and moldy. And that's a theme that you see uh, repeating to a certain degree in a lot of the abduction literature as well. Not that I'm saying that they're the same thing. I definitely think that perhaps sleep paralysis slash old hag slash abduction phenomena are, are part of the same uh, constellation of phenomena. Um, but that's, but, uh, it's, it's an interesting connection though, nonetheless. Wasn't there some, you looked at Streber's account and wasn't there some contradictions in some of the things that he said about the, how the beings smelled? No, no, there is, there is, there's, there's, um, there's, so I'm, I'm personally a, a bit of a Whitley Streber apologist. Um, I feel that something happened to the man and that he has spent the rest of his life trying to make sense of it and rearticulate it. Sure. I Having feel, said that, I feel the same sorry, way. I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to, to be, to be where he was in his career and to do what he did is the most career suicidal thing that anyone could have, anyone could have, could have done. And uh, the other thing that I am, um, the other thing, which is sort of a backhanded compliment that people say is that if he was going to make up if he was going to incorporate these supposed experiences into a fiction, he could have done a better job of it <laughs> because he was a better, he was a better novel writer and, and his novels were more coherent than, you know, his subsequent output with, the, with trying to relate his experiences and trying to make them into something sensible. So I do think something generally happened to him. Having said that, um, generally speaking, so the, the, the connection between smell and memory is extremely strong. And what that means is that, you really only need one exposure to a certain smell to recognize it for the rest of your life. Whether or not you can articulate what it was is a different matter, but you will recognize that smell for the rest of your life because smell is deeply linked to involuntary memory. Right. Uh, so much, so much so that like uh, Alzheimer patients notice a decrease in the sense of smell, which is usually correlated with with um, with uh, a diminishment, a, a reduction in in you know cognitive capabilities. So. Um, the fact that Whitley Strieber's recollection of the way that his visitors, quote unquote, smelled has evolved over time is especially problematic. Um, the first time he smelled them, he, uh, asked actually in an interesting sort of reflection of a lot of, uh, olfactory philosophy. He said, I can't believe you unless I can smell you because we tend to trust our noses more than our eyes actually from a philosophical standpoint. And so one of the visitors let them smell its arm, and he said that it smelled like musty cardboard, musty, moldy cardboard. Um, but through subsequent through subsequent iterations of him remembering this, he has since said that it smelled like um, stinky cheese, and he has later smelled, said that it smelled like a hot organic smell. Um, earlier in his life, he claimed to have recalled a – a, an example where he had a visitation that smelled like burning cardboard. So it's constantly evolving, which to an olfactory scientist would be viewed with great suspicion. However, being again, a Whitley Strieber apologist, um, I have to wonder if there isn't something else at play here. For example, um, at least one of those subsequent revisions was obtained under hypnotic regression. And, because olfactory scientists don't feel that people can, in general, recreate a picture in their minds, like if I ask you to look, imagine a circle, you can imagine a circle. But if I ask you to imagine the smell of a pizza, science says that you're actually not imagining the smell of a pizza. You're sort of prefabricating it, and it's, it's, not, it's not possible with the same degree of clarity that we can imagine something in our mind's eye. So the fact that some of these smells that he remembered and he sort of revised later were, were recovered with uh, hypnotic regression – seems to make it a bit problematic as to ha as to whether or not they were actually what he was smelling or if there were some other influences. So that's one way to explain away um, 
some of these discrepancies in his in his uh, recollections. The other way is to just say that he's constantly trying to re evolve, re reevaluate rather. Yeah. Um, smell. I mean, uh, it, again, it's that tip of the nose thing. He smells something, and the smell in his mind hasn't changed, but he's still seeking the words to articulate what that smell was. Well, and um, a- another way to look at that is that when we remember something, we're actually remembering the last time that we remembered it. So it turns into like a game of telephone in a way where the, yes. the memories themselves do actually evolve and change re- regardless of whether we want them to or not. I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if olfaction sort of uh, overrides that because again, the, 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 the connection between smell and memory, the, the strength there cannot be overemphasized. Um, but at the same time, yeah, that's a really good point um, because I mean, it's anybody who's ever, uh, I mean, I know some people who have had who have who have recalled an experience a little bit differently than it actually happened so many times that it becomes their own version of the truth. So mm-hmm. it's, it's sort of a similar thing. Let's get into the UFO smells, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think that we we've, we've talked a lot about UFOs. Like I said, the main the main focus I felt in the book was Sasquatch, and I really want to get into that. But there's two common smells with UFOs, and that would be ozone and sulfur. Yes. So mm-hmm. why do we yeah. get we get this? We seem to get a much more prevalence of sulfur in these UFO cases. Well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, let me ask you this. Does some of these things like o- ozone, especially now, I know, you know, you know, we're not big on the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis very much, but does any of this lend to the fact that we may be dealing with some kind of physical craft because you do have an, in, an influence that it may be from this craft that is creating these smells. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, so to sort of understand that we have to dial it back a little bit into sort of classical, um, classical literature. So the term sulfur and the term for the divine in Greek, uh, thion and thios both share the same root because it was believed by the Greeks that the smell after a lightning strike and the smell of sulfur were the same thing. Um, which obviously nowadays we know that those are two different things. One is ozone, one is sulfur. Um, it's interesting to look at how that, that belief that, uh, the smell of sulfur comes from the divine was reflected later in, uh, in the Bible where, uh, oftentimes the cleansing effect of God would be equated with sulfur. Sulfur was long been an, as an anti-fumigant, a, um, a, uh, It's an antimicrobial agent. That's the reason a lot of face creams still have sulfur in them. Um, So, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed with uh, fire and brimstone. God's cleansing breath was equated to a breath of brimstone. So uh, when Satan was cast into a, you know, a lake of of lake of uh, burning sulfur, lake of burning brimstone, it was more of an attempt of God to cleanse Satan of his evil than it was the fact that sulfur just so happened to be stinky. Now, having said that, um, there is this continuing conflation between sulfur and ozone. This, this, um, you know, the lightning strikes from Zeus coming to the ground and releasing this sulfur smell, which is really an ozone smell, and this sort of, uh, this sort of smell of sulfur as well. To the extent that uh, even people like Ben Franklin often said that lightning strikes would generate a sulfurous smell. So you have this conflation throughout history, even though anyone who has smelled the two of them know that they smell nothing alike. Yeah. Um, you will find this this sort of mixing up of the terms. Oh well, it smelled like ozone, or it smelled like sulfur. Um, it, you know, it, not only did people think that uh, ozone smelled like sulfur in the case of lightning, but sometimes people thought that sulfur smelled like ozone. They got it the other way around. A lot of times in um, the late 1900s, or rather late 1800s, there were ascribed certain um, medicinal qualities to living by the seashore because of the ozone in the air. Well, it was actually the dimethyl sulfide in the air. It was actually the sulfur compound in the air that people were smelling when they smelled ozone. So back and forth throughout history, you have this conflation of the two ideas. Um, but having said that, you, you do have these two odors being reported the most in UFO cases. Interestingly enough, whenever people don't describe the specific odor, it seems like it's more reliable of an indicator of what they're actually smelling. What do I mean by that? It's less reliable for people to say it smelled like ozone, for me at least, 
as it is for them to say, oh, it smelled just like after a lightning strike, or it smelled like you know electrical wire burning, or it smelled like um, you know the smell after a thunderstorm. These things to me tend to indicate the smell of ozone more than them just coming out and saying ozone. Um, so you do have a lot of cases where people do um, notice ozone in conjunction with um, with what we would interpret as structured craft. Um, there was a pretty strong push in uh, early ufology to dismiss encounters where people claim that they smell sulfur and to reinterpret them as the smell of ozone. People, you know, literally people would say it smelled like sulfur and they'd say, oh, no, you were smelling ozone because they were trying to reinforce sort of the nuts and bolts extraterrestrial hypothesis. And ozone would be um, a logical uh, byproduct of any sort of nuts and bolts spacecraft. I mean, it's a byproduct of, of uh, you know, of uh, – of combustion engines that we have today. Yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, there is, um, so sulfur, sorry, sorry, sulfur. Um, so ozone's, uh, construction is photochemical, meaning that, um, whenever there is energy released in the air, it has the potential to create ozone to strip, um, three oxygen molecules, sorry, two oxygen molecules, um, apart and rejoin them so that, uh, they recombine as this ozone smell. Um, and what we would normally associate with that would be the appearance of a blue or purple photochemically reacting light. And what, it's interesting to look because there are certain cases within the literature where people do notice a blue or purple light associated with a UFO and notice the smell of ozone. So it's, it's strongly suggested that perhaps there is a nuts and bolts component to this. But at the same time, I feel uncomfortable saying, well, if you smelled ozone, you were, so if you smelled sulfur, rather, you were actually smelling ozone. Because if we do that, we might as well say, well, if you saw a UFO, you actually saw Venus or you actually saw an airplane. You know, <laughs> just you're going and you're, you're revising witness testimony yeah. to your own ends. Yeah. Um, Agreed. So having, there's no. also there's also the correlation there, too. And you make this throughout the book that, you know, if you're if you're having these spirit manifestations and you're smelling sulfur, but then you're also smelling sulfur to UFO uh, experience and the abduction experience, it's also in there, too. So are we dealing with something that – are we dealing with two separate things? Or are we dealing with the same – again, are we dealing with the same phenomenon that has the same effects? Right. And you know, I, I haven't been involved in this as long as a lot of people who are still adhering to the nuts and bolts thing. But at the same time, I tried my best to come into this topic with the least amount of assumptions. And after spending some time with it and really sitting with all of this data um, – I think at the very least we are dealing with different things that use similar methods. Um, the fact that there is such a strong consistency of odors across different phenomena <laughs> seems to suggest that something, something similar is at play. Um, in the case of sulfur, you know, a lot of people don't, a lot of people. So there are plenty of cases that I go into that, that involve chemical smells and UFOs, but um, there are plenty of cases as well that involve specifically sulfurous smells. Oftentimes, the entities of the craft will smell like rotten eggs. Or they'll smell stinky. Um, people have even, you know, been so crass as to say it smells like a. F- um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's there's um, there is no shortage of cases in uh, mutual UFO network newsletters and flying saucer review issues where people have seen something that smells like some sort of very strong sulfur. So some people might say it smelled like natural gas, which we've talked about. People might say it smells like rotten eggs. People might say it smelled like, um, there was a case where someone said it smelled like sulfuric acid. So there's always this underlying sulfur, uh, component as well. And again, we find more conflating examples, just like you would find, um, cases where there was a haunting and perhaps the smell had soaked into the, uh, house Sometimes you have to wonder if someone's car battery dies while they see a UFO and they step outside and they smell sulfur, they might be smelling the UFO. They might be smelling an outgassing of sulfur from their car battery because that's the thing too. So uh, trying to find a clear path through all this is difficult, but at the end of the day, you have to say, you know, sulfur is still a, a common recurring theme throughout all these cases. What other smells are associated with UFOs? So uh, after you look at um, ozone and and sulfur, um, so, some distant you know, some distant third and fourth places arrive. Um, you will find that uh, a lot of there are also also a lot of chemical smells, a lot of antiseptic smells. Um, 
certain people have claimed that there's an ammonia smell, um, which they associate especially with the inside of craft. Um, you know, uh, there are smells of camphor, which uh, occur uh, often as well, which is a sort of a medicinal plant. Um, but there are also cases that involve a burning smell. Um, sometimes the burning smell is um, is noted in abduction experiences. Sometimes it's noted in just generic um, – sometimes it's noted in generic uh, UFO sightings. The smell of burning is so persistent – uh, in certain abduction cases, that a 1994 MUFON study claimed that uh, over 20% of abductees described the smell of their own hair burning, hmm. um, which is an interesting, which is an interesting fact to uh, correlate with the idea of ozone, because ozone implies a certain amount of uh, energy being released. Um, it implies an amount of energy being released to the, into the environment. I have to wonder if people are smelling a burning smell, if perhaps sometimes in these cases they aren't smelling aspects of their own physiology burning. I mean, it's a sad example, but um, a lot of chemotherapy or rather radiation therapy patients will notice that they, they, they feel as though they can actually smell their own body burning, their own flesh burning. Um, but their doctors will often reassure them that no, it's just, you're just smelling ozone, but they, they often correlate those two smells together. Um, so there is a suggestion that perhaps there isn't some sort of um, radiation being released from these objects that uh, tends to tends to generate these smells, not only in terms of interaction with the environment, but in terms of, um, you know, the witnesses themselves, because every UFO case involves, you know, involves human beings looking at something, usually in an atmosphere where they would, be susceptible to to some sort of radiation. Well, we know in at least one case. Uh, what is the the, the Canadian case? Michalik, the guy who appro- uh, I, I, who approached I've, I've heard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he approached the UFOs and act, the, this landed flying saucer. And actually, I mean, there's physical proof. I mean, the guy. There's pictures of him in the hospital with these third degree burns. That uh, are in the in are in these weird patterns. I'm sure he was smelling. He had to be smelling his own skin burning at a certain point. It's one of it's one of the best Canadian cases. One of the best <laughs> cases. Period. Um, you often hear it referred to as the Falcon Lake case as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, Mitchell, you also look at the you also look at the Cash Landrum case and postulate mm-hmm. some things about the uh, what they were smelling. This chemical smell could have just been their own car beginning to combust. So I think that's a good point as well. Right. I mean, so like, for example, in the Michelet case, um, his, uh, I believe it was his son, um, reported that he smelled like rotten eggs and burned electrical circuits, which again, there you have sulfur, hydrogen sulfide and, uh, ozone. Right. Together. And in the case of cash landrum, it's not often addressed probably because it occurred, I believe under hypnotic regression, which again, as we've admitted is sort of a, a problem. Um, but, um, with the case of cash Landrum, they reported, uh, uh, Betty cash and Vicky Landrum reported that this UFO that they saw, which ended up giving them pretty severe burns, um, smelled like lighter fluid, which definitely has this sort of, um, hydrocarbon esque, uh, smell to it. Now, could it have been something in their car reacting possibly, but you do have a handful of cases, especially in a 1950s French flap, um, where people noticed uh, this hydrocarbon sort of gasoline esque smell um, associated with the encounter. Um, so every so what, what what sort of tended to emerge as I went through this is that it seemed to me, and this is sort of an unspoken thing that emerges as you read the chapters, but it seemed to me that whenever people smelled something of a more chemical nature or a more um, ozone type nature, it seems to be more along the lines of conventional aircraft. I think there are a lot of people who argue that uh, in the cash landrum case, that that was uh, some an unconventional aircraft that they had just happened to stumble upon a test of. Um, and when people uh, tended to notice something along the lines, that was a little bit more, a little bit stranger, for example, um, specifically the sulfur smells, um, that uh, those tend to be the more high strange cases, the cases that seem to actually be people interacting with something that is not human. Yeah. Yeah. 
Agreed. Yeah, good. Look, I've said before. I think we we deal sometimes with with two different phenomenon, and that it gets lumped into one. One would be that there actually are craft that are either a experimental by our own government or b part of a breakaway civilization, and you can go to work by Richard Dolan and Walter Bosley and look at that stuff and see that that's a possibility too. And then b would be these entities that are abducting people and with that is very similar to fairy lore, very similar to um, uh, very, very similar to other aspects of this phenomena, sleep paralysis being one of them. So I think you're dealing with two different aspects here and then you just gets, it just gets thrown and lumped into UFOs, ETs, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more strongly. Um, I love Walter's work. Um, oh. I, uh, I think that oftentimes the the human side of that equation likes to use the pageantry of the of the of the high strange, possibly to sort of cover up its own tracks. Um, but yeah, I think anybody who is involved in this and thinks that oh. all spirits are of one explanation, all. Um, UFO phenomena are of one explanation. All Sasquatch events are of one uh, explanation. Is is really um, is is really not being really honest with themselves. Yeah. I think there are multiple explanations that are involved in each of these categories. And I do, th- which is again, some people will say we're just trying to write it all off. I mean, no. I think that it's, I think that it's probably uh, my. Every time people ask me this, my numbers change, but I think it's probably sixty percent misidentification. Um, 30%, uh, you know, 30% deliberate, uh, governmental, um, governmental misidentification in terms of like, you know, natural phenomena versus something that's an unorthodox aircraft. And I think there's a genuine 10% that is really, really weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's get into Bigfoot. The stuff that uh, yes. the stuff that Rob really loves. <laughs> Apparently from this book, I understand <laughs> That uh, Bigfoot smells really, really bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I do want to share with you that my favorite chapter title in the book, by the way, is chapter 19, which is Sasquatch smells garbage, decay, bo, and burning. That's that's my favorite chapter title. I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an embarrassment of riches. It really is. Um, or Bigfoot. And, you know, you'll you'll find certain researchers who have claimed that. So John Green claimed that uh, John Green, a very famous Bigfoot researcher, claimed that Bigfoot odors did not happen in even in really that many cases. Um, certainly not a majority. But um, I have to say that I think that people are missing some nuance in that statement. John Green focused a lot of his research on the sort of Pacific Northwest Bigfoot. But if you look at something like the skunk ape, like the flirty and skunk ape, there was a flap in the 1970s that was literally like one of the hallmarks of that flap was how bad the skunk ape smelled. So I think that when John Green said that he was really referring to that sort of Pacific Northwest thing. Um, it's interesting. It's like a grab bag in terms of what Bigfoot smells like. I mean, there and, and some of the descriptions are the most hilariously disgusting <laughs> things you've ever smelled. Like a diaper, a used diaper filled with roadkill. Like <laughs> my favorite one that I've mentioned a couple of times, but I'm mentioned here in case people haven't heard it. Is this guy in Idaho, and I believe in the '90s, who said he saw Bigfoot and it reminded him of when he was working on a sheep farm. And whenever one of the sheep would give birth to a stillborn lamb, it was just like that smell, which is like the most revoltingly disgusting thing I could possibly <laughs> think of. Like absolutely awful. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. It gets hilarious. Right. Like, you know, and you could just like, you could just see this guy saying this too, just like it just smelled like a dang old sheep giving birth. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And then one of my epigraphs is like it smelled like an overweight lineman's armpit after a leak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's no shortage. Like it's it's impossible to be comprehensive with uh, with the sort of amount and variety of Bigfoot smells, but they they do certain they do certainly lend themselves into certain categories. Um, you have animalistic smells like skunk smells, wet dog smells. Um, ammonia urine type smells then you have smells that are just sort of like 
a uh, well, you have you have a body odor smells like human body odor. Um, burning smells, which is kind of odd for a creature to smell like burning something burning, but we can talk about that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, garbage and decay smells, and then you also have sulfur smells. It's interesting with all these phenomena. You notice, you tend to notice. So we've talked about a lot of these different things. If there is one overarching theme amongst all these smells in spirit phenomena and UFOs and Bigfoot, it's the idea of entropy. It's the idea of decay. It's the idea of stuff breaking down. Um, what I find is really interesting because. You know, for example, so a lot of people have said that, for example, Bigfoot smells like something dead. You have to take that apart because there's not like a smell that is, you know, dead smell, you know, D2S or D2O. It's it's a variety of compounds. You have, you know, cadaverine and putrescine, which are two different compounds that, uh, that manifest themselves. Um, indole and scatol, which are two different indole compounds. Um, but a variety of sulfur compounds manifest themselves, not the least of which, again, is hydrogen sulfide. Imagine that. Um, so it's that tip of the phenomena, tip of the phenomena, tip of the nose thing, where people notice um, these phenomena and they try to describe what they smell like. And the best that they can do is arrive at some sort of vague description of something being dead. But that doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what compounds they're smelling. Um, so especially in like with Sasquatch, these descriptions tend to be so, um, what's the right word? Robust. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so, uh, so, 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 so flowery that, um, that's a good that, way to uh, put it. Yeah. Uh, flowery. It's ironic. A right way to put it. <laughs> they tend to be so, these descriptions tend to be so flowery that, um, that you, you really have to sort of take the time to break down exactly what they might mean in each individual case. <sighs> We like makes like Sasquatch cologne. <laughs> you had to say that. You know what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk. I can't say it. I can't. Can I say it on, on, on Spirit Normal? I can't remember. <laughs> the scene in Anchorman, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's, there's a, I think of the way that I put it, I think the way that I put it in the book is like the scene from Anchorman where a disgusting cologne is described in escalating measures, culminating with a, descri- a comparison to Bigfoot's genitalia. That's the way I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, right. The thing about this book, man, like sometimes like I have to talk about farts and I have to talk about some <laughs> stuff. Like there's, yeah, you, you, ter- you term farts as flatus. You flatus. Do very, flatus. It's, it's very pro- appropriate. Yeah, it's very I clinical. Have flatus. <laughs> and, and I also have to talk about, I think there's one lot where I talk about Bigfoot's foreskin or something. It's just, it's. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> that may be new in Fortiana. You know, that, yeah, there's, just, that may be something new there. This is definitely <laughs> uncharted territory. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, God, it's uncharted. <laughs> well, you have this idea. You also talk about in the book about the scent glands and the possibility that Bigfoot, if we're dealing with a physical animal, and that's a big if, as we'll get into in a bit, whether or not he's turning these scent glands on. Because you do talk about how people will all of a sudden see Bigfoot and then they'll smell him. And sometimes it's the other way around, but sometimes it's this way. Yeah, so there's there's a loose trend. When Sasquatch seem to be unaware that they have been noticed, they tend to not emit an odor as often, which combined with the way that the scent seems to act has led people to speculate whether or not there's a scent gland. Um, some witnesses have said that the smell can turn itself on and off like a light switch. Um, like literally they're looking at something and at one moment and the next moment it's like a wall just hits them. Um there's been a lot of discussion of whether or not Sasquatch has a scent gland. Again, just like with, like I was talking about at the beginning of the show, um, little paragraphs here and there about stuff. But no one's ever really compiled all and said, let's take a look at if this actually is a possibility. Um, the question is not if Sasquatch has scent glands. The question is, does Sasquatch have strong smelling scent glands? We as humans have scent glands too. We just we just don't control them. So like, you know, does, does Sasquatch have strong smelling, voluntarily controlled scent glands? Um, before recent years, there wasn't a lot of suggestion or a lot of evidence that primates actually had, um, the ability to control scent glands to to sort of preface this too. This is predicated off an assumption that Sasquatch is a primate. Um, if Sasquatch is a flesh and blood creature, it is a primate. I have some nuanced opinions about that, but let's go from here. Um, generally speaking, um, uh, 
mustelids, so like skunks, wolverines, weasels, otters, badgers, etc., um, are the ones who are most likely to have to exert uh, control of a voluntary uh, sick gland. But a lot of carnivores have them: bears, cats, dogs, hyenas, etc. Um, but recently, within uh, the last two or three years, um, there has been research that has proven that mountain gorillas can actually not only control when they release certain scents, but actually use them as a form of interspecies communication, sort of communicating um, communicating their role in the troop, as it were. Um, and, you know, you sort of see the same suggestion of control of scent over uh, in, in Sasquatch encounters. Um, there are certain, in, certain encounters where um, people, again, as I said, will notice a certain uh, smell that just absolutely hits them like – like a wall, like they run into a wall and then it's not there in a certain spot. Um, or they, you know, it, it, it feels like somebody's, you know, uh, turning a light switch on and on, um, on and off rather. Uh, there was a, uh, guy who was hunting elk in British Columbia in 2007 who noticed a smell that was said was like just absolutely awful, like a wet dog, dead animal smell. And he looked through his scope and he saw what he described later as a Sasquatch. And, um, he said that the odor arrived and left as if someone had just like turned it on and off with a light switch. Um, so there is definitely some suggestion that a Sasquatch is a primate and has this scent gland quality or the scent gland ability. Um, but it would be, it would definitely be an ability that is much more sophisticated than any other ape has exhibited its ability to produce. Um, moreover, it seems like if this is a possibility, there is some indication that a certain a certain repertoire of odors could be suggested. Um, there was a, a book called our life with Bigfoot by Christopher Noel, um, who talked about big, basically Bigfoot habituators. And it was someone who claimed that they had a problem with Bigfoot on their property who in the course of several minutes literally had different smells assail them. So in other words, the, the body odor smell, the dead body smell, the skunk smell all hit them <laughs> at once. Um, which would be, I mean, again, this is completely unprecedented in the animal kingdom. Not only do you have control, not only does a primate have control to that extent over a scent gland, but they can actually choose from which scent they choose to use. But, you know, who knows? Maybe that's a thing. Oh, I'm not scaring this guy. I need to get the garbage smell going. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's not that's working. Part, that's part. Okay, how about wet dead dog? We'll get that. We'll get that going too. <laughs> yeah, he, he's trying to mix it. He's like he's like a scent DJ. He's trying to mix and match different smells. Like, <laughs> that, wet dog, wet dog urine. Wet dog urine. Oh, okay. The, that what that uh, that wacky Bigfoot man. Let, let's talk a little bit about some of the smells that are associated with some of the more high strangeness in. Counters of Bigfoot. Yeah, so the burning smell is something that I find interesting. You, uh, people have equated uh, so so when gorillas become uh, agitated, especially around poachers or something, um, they will emit a smell that some people have claimed is like burning rubber. As we've mentioned before, rubber um, is often vulcanized and often releases sort of a sulfur smell when it's burned because of the vulcanization process. Um, but having said that, um, you will you will often find sort of a burning um, hair smell associated with with Sasquatch, and oftentimes when you when you see this burning smell, you will find that the Sasquatch tend to not behave in very primatological ways. Um, they will seem impervious to gunfire. They will have glowing eyes, and people have written this off as eye shine. I'm sure that there's some eye shine cases, but I'm also sure that there are some cases where people literally are seeing something with eyes that are literally self-illuminating, which is not a biological trait of any creature on the, on the planet short of maybe some deep sea fish, but even then their eyes aren't illuminating with other parts of their body. Um, and you will find these sort of, this sort of cluster of, of smells that seem less animalistic. They seem less organic, um, around the cases that tend to be weirder. Um, a lot of times you'll find people who uh, – there was one case that I saw that I read from uh, Kentucky where there was this creature that by all descriptions looked like Bigfoot, albeit with a giant horn coming out of its head, um, that smelled like burning gunpowder. And you will find that a lot of these uh, stinky Bigfoot in terms of, in terms of having a spirit smell um, will actually uh, – will actually – 
tend to exhibit, again, these sort of high strange attributes, these attributes that don't seem like they're grounded in any sort of reality. So I suggest that perhaps there are two things happening. Um, not unlike Mike Clellan's Owls. Have you talked to Mike on the show? Oh, yeah, we have. Mm-hmm. So anyone who hasn't listened to Mike's interview with Adam and company, go back and listen to it and come back to this. Um, but not unlike Mike Clellan's Owls, perhaps there is a phenomena that uses to use the imagery of a flesh and blood creature that is undiscovered <laughs> like, um, to its own ends. So in other words, you have two different things happening. Again, this, this idea that we talked about earlier, this nuanced idea that perhaps um, what, what may, certain phenomena are all one monolithic thing, perhaps there are multiple things happening. Perhaps there is a very animalistic, very, very biological Bigfoot out there that sometimes has its imagery co-opted for whatever reason – um, by an unknown intelligence to um, to uh, for, for its own ends, who knows what? Um, but sometimes that that imagery, that sort of imagery, in terms of the way that the uh, UFO phenomena tends to uh, utilize owls or deer or certain other animals um, for its own ends, perhaps that same uh, that same process is going on with Bigfoot and the UFO phenomena, or it could be something that that triggers a very primal response in us because we as we evolved we killed up all all the other humanoid bipeds and it did it appears to us as a humanoid biped that might be something that really triggers that primal fear aspect right uh Let's get to one more subject, and that is some of the speculation that you do in the book. And this I thought was interesting, specifically dealing with sulfur and its association with an with altered states. I'm I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You broke up. The uh, association of sulfur with altered states. Yes, so it's interesting because um, because. So, so okay. So let's let's sort of sort of back up this process because whenever you work on a project like this, you've got to say to yourself, "So what? So, so, so what if a lot of these things tend to smell like sulfur? Like, what difference does that make?" Um, and I was very surprised to notice that um, certain research had taken place um, that suggests that hydrogen sulfide can actually uh, in- introduce a state of suspended animation. In, mam- in mammals, um, this particular attribute of hydrogen sulfide um, has been alluded to for years. There were some actually some ancient, uh, I believe some ancient Greek writings that uh, talked about a certain cave where dogs could be placed in the cave and they would pass out, and then you'd bring them out of the cave and slowly but surely they'd wake up and they'd reanimate. But in 2005, um, a gentleman by the name of Mark Roth, who was the director of the Roth Lab at the Hutchinson Center of the university of Washington um, said in a Ted talk that he had actually been able to induce suspended animation in mice by producing them to carefully measured amounts of hydrogen sulfide, because what happens is that hydrogen sulfide steps in like a game of musical chairs and um, occupies the place in the respiratory system, that oxygen would in carefully monitored settings. Um, and, and the, the results of this were astounding um, for about six hours. These mice were under, uh, and their uh, their respiration dropped to 10 breaths per minute. Their baseline had been 120, and their body temperature had dropped from um, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit to 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So they were essentially cold blood. This is like this is a cryo sleep that you know from film. This is putting people under for long space flights, and that's the reason that he was excited about it. But what occurred to me is that if you have the sulfurous smell in a lot of these cases, which people often just describe as sulfur. And I think anybody in the audience would, if you, if you smell rotten eggs, so it smells like sulfur because that's just like, that's to me, that's in my experience. That's the most, that's the strongest connection that people have between sulfur and uh, that, that rotten egg smells. They just say it smells like sulfur. They don't bother saying it smells like rotten eggs. Um, so if, if this hydrogen sulfide smell is as, is as um, the widespread as I believe it is, um, it seems to suggest that perhaps this might be used to introduce a state, if not a state of suspended animation, an altered state in people. Now, mm-hmm. no one's saying that hydrogen sulfide is a, hallucin- a, a, a an hallucinogen. 
um, because it definitely isn't. But the fact remains that there is most certainly when your body goes from the state of awareness to this state of suspended animation, there must be some sort of liminal state in between where you're sort of in that sort of sleep paralysis state. You're in that hypnagogic in between waking and between sleeping state where, um, where this perhaps other intelligence can interact with you. Right. Um, and uh, it's sort of basically what I'm getting at is that it sets the stage for something very objective, something that, that I think is very real um, entering in inter- interacting with your own consciousness. Um, it's just a working theory. There are some, there are some virtues to it and there's some, um, detractions from the possibility that's actually a thing. I think it's interesting to look at the amount of times that people tend to surrender their own motor control in these encounters. Um, people describe paralysis. People describe wanting to lay down, um, in cases that involve ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, et cetera, uh, which is definitely again, something consistent with the idea that you're slowly being put into the state of suspended animation. Um, now, again, one of the detractors from this is that it would require a great degree of finesse, and where is this phenomena getting its hydrogen sulfide from? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would presume that any phenomena, if I if I lump together you know, the unexplained as a whole, it seems to be very much in control of the situation. It seems to... Um, it seems to only be photographed when it wishes to be photographed. It seems to only be noticed or, or only be... Um, it seems to only be only gain attention when it wishes to gain attention to put it that way. Something with that sort of level of omnipotence, I would not be surprised would be able to manipulate the environment and manipulate through the elements to such an extent that it could actually use this to sort of put us into this altered state. Yeah. It it would have to be something that can, yeah, like you said, manipulate the environment, manipulate molecules or atoms almost at a, at that level and you would probably be dealing with something that is that is spiritual in nature in that respect very possible well, yeah you know and, and spiritual in the sense that spiritual in the sense that we currently understand it you know right. something that is um, something that is definitely um I would say metaphysical. I'll be a little bit more comfortable with that because spiritual has like <laughs> certain religious connotations. Sure. So I'll be more comfortable with saying like metaphysical. Sure. But yeah. Your, 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 your point is well taken. It would, it, it, uh, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a possible scientific, it's possible scientific explanation for something that is very unscientific in the way that I understand yep. it now. Well, Josh, uh, it's been a very enlightening, uh, and very, you know, very spelly as well. But uh, I want to. Uh, I, so. I, w- I want to ask uh, where you know tell people where they can get the book and also your web presence and whether there is going to be a scratch and sniff version coming out soon. <laughs> okay, so first thing first, um, you can find <laughs> copies of Brimstone Deceit and A Trojan Feast at both Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. In a variety of formats, including paperback, um, hardcover for a Trojan Feast as well, and uh, certain e-readers like Kindle. There's some, also something else called a Kubo. I'm not sure what that is, um, but like, yeah, uh, what, pick your pick your poison on that. Um, my web presence is at joshuacutchin.com. I maintain a blog there that I, I throw up something probably about once once a month. Um, I'm trying to get better about it, but just random random brain droppings that I have. Um, and then as to the scratch and sniff question, I have actually looked into this because I think it would be a great thing to have. Um, I think it would be a great thing to have, especially at lectures and stuff. But um, it's hard to find people who will produce small batch quantities of dead lamb. <laughs> it's a pretty niche market. Uh, Sasquatch yeah. wet dog body odor. Yeah. Sasquatch exactly. garbage body odor. <laughs> Combination well, I, of the two, body odor. <laughs> I've, 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 looked into it. I've looked into it. It would be like it would be. It would be so cool. But I don't think it's it's feasible at that uh, at a research and development or price point level. So, <laughs> so no, no but, uh, well, well, the the kids version, possibly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe you could do it that C-Jack. way. Jack, <laughs> that's question. That's question. Smells bad. <laughs> Smells like a <laughs> smells like a linebacker in the middle of July with a skunk next yeah, right. to him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Josh, thank you so much, sir. Hey, Stay on the line for us, and we are going to be back to close the show out on Conspiracy Normal.
Look who's here, Rob. Holy crap. Hey, Luke. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> You know, uh, oh my god! I just like finally decided to come and be a part of it, man. Yeah, I, I didn't I'm have impressed. To, I didn't have to do much today. I kind of just stood around all day. So I mean, got a little extra energy. Well, well, since we're actually doing two shows tonight, this will actually be two shows in a row. I mean, amazing. Wait, I didn't show up for the last one. What are you talking no, about? No, like we're doing another show. This tonight. is the last one. Oh. <laughs> we got another show. We're gonna we're gonna record with Doctor Future. So. Word, word. How you been, Luke? And pretty good. I just I've been on them streets slinging that barbecue and yeah, <laughs> and uh, putting storm shelters in. Still exciting, exciting. You know my passion in life. Taking bites out of uh, out of customer sandwiches before they get them. <laughs> I didn't do that. No. I, <laughs> It's a false claim. I do drop their their food on the floor all the time. And pick it up, put it back in the box. But you know. oh yeah, well you know. <laughs> I guess we won't say what barbecue establishment Luke no, works at. So <laughs> no. you don't go to don't go to the one Luke works at. They're, cor- <laughs> they're corporate, so we don't care. Well, five second rule is universal anyway. Exactly. Right, right. And, and you throw it back in the fryer, and you know, yeah, yeah. sanitary. The, yeah. the floor dust just cooks into it. <laughs> Get some some leaves and twigs on it. Uh, <laughs> Rob, what'd you think, man, of that interview with uh, Joshua Cutchin? Yeah, I, I love Joshua. Every time it's like it's he, like the first time the Trojan Feast. It was you. Mm-hmm. You, you kind of explained to me it was like, yeah, you know, it's like relating like Bigfoot and fairies and food. And I was like, okay, so that's cool. I've always wondered what fairies ate, but then he takes it to like a totally different angle, and it's all these. Um, you know, strange interrelationships between all these different sort of, uh, um, you know, different facets of, of, of that kind of, kind of thing. And it was the same this time with, with the, the smells. Like I had no idea where it was going to go or how deep it was going to go, but he always takes it to like this really cool, cool kind of angle and interconnects everything. And I just, yeah. I don't know. He's a great guest. He does a hell of a research and there's a lot of different small stories that are in the book. I mean, I highly, highly recommend it. I and mean, it's like 318 pages long, but there's a bunch of footnotes and a, a huge bibliography and index. It takes <laughs> like another over 100 pages. Yeah, so yeah I should I, tell you with the, the kind of research that he puts into it. Yeah, it's evident because you can ask him something like anything like <laughs> mildly related and he'll have something to say about it. Or Right. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, man, I just... This, cold is killing me man i'm over here bundled up like you usually are in a- <laughs> me too and my, and my nose is over here dripping like a faucet yeah well, we need to get you a blanket man there's one right there for you yeah, we can all like curl up together on the couch and yeah. keep each other warm what, what happened was me and curl adam made warp. up <laughs> oh yeah well you know sometimes things one thing leads to another <laughs> it, it was after rob's party the other night oh yeah yeah <laughs> Hey, I wanted to ask you, Luke, since yeah. you haven't been here, I wanted, what do you think about this Pizzagate thing? We talked about this a lot on the last I, show. I think it's BS. I think it's total BS. Yeah. I think it's just some some idiot just made an accusation and like all the weird paranoid Alex Jones listeners just like all jumped the wa- the bandwagon and Did you tell me that at out. your job you saw like hashtag Pizzagate? Yeah. Um <laughs> on the bathroom or something. <laughs> yeah, it means something, man. I'm on to it. It's, it's, uh, it goes know, deep. I'll say it again. I'm fifty fifty on it. I mean, there could be something there. There could not be. Um, I did notice that I've gotten a lot of emails about Thad McCracken. <laughs> really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, I I I like Thad, but he is a hundred miles an hour man, and I just wanted to be like, dude, breathe, take a breath. I mean, See, honestly, if you don't get emails, you're not doing it right. Yeah, it's I'm true. Ashamed. It's true. Well, that's a good sign if people are listening. If you get, you know, constructive or negative, I, I need emails. to say some more hateful shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, that's how i used to get those emails where you would say something about population control but uh, which i still believe in nothing's changed Go but, on. yeah but it, you know thad had an interesting perspective and that's why i wanted to get him on but i i think it's some of his perspective i have to say this is that i feel like sometimes that people that live there's a lot of there's people that live like out there in like California and the, and the West Coast they have their own i think set of values about things and ideas 
which is okay. That's fine. But <laughs> sometimes that there's an in, sometimes there's an insular approach that they have that is just as just that is just as insular and isolated as the approach is to like people in the in the the in the conservative South. Okay, so. They definitely have a point of view, or maybe they don't look into things as as much as possible. That being said, I thought that Thad's um, warning against a, instigating a witch hunt was very profound, and that's why I had him on. Um, I've still not kind of given up on the whole Pizzagate thing. I think there might be something to it, but I'm not entirely 100% sure. This was kind of weird, though. And I want to lead this into another discussion about some other things that are going on right now. But uh, this is from the Colbert Show. I'm going to play this clip, and this is from this is from quite a few weeks ago now, where he was talking about PizzaGate. But uh, there's a reason I want to play this, and you will see why at the end. And the craziest. And the craziest fake news of all is something called Pizzagate. People actually believe a conspiracy theory that Hillary Clinton and her former campaign manager, John Podesta, ran a child sex ring at a pizzeria in D.C. This is a lie. We all know the only people who are trapped in a pizza place are those robots at Chuck E. Cheese. I've seen Westworld. One day they're going to rise up and kill us all. Now, according to the folks with the spider eggs hatching in their brains, Clinton and Podesta have a series of smuggling tunnels that connect to the basement of this pizzeria. But police refuse to investigate the basement crime scene on the flimsy excuse that the pizzeria does not have a basement. (laughs) That's how deep this goes. Ground level. Okay. So, in that statement... Stephen Colbert, that's of course from the Colbert Show. Uh, he makes the statement that you know this whole idea. They talked about Edgar Madison Welch looking for the tunnels that are supposedly in the basement, right? Right, and <clears throat> this is the whole. This is this whole idea and the conspiracy theory about PizzaGate that there is a basement that they keep the kids in. All this stuff, but apparently, according to Stephen Colbert's sources, there is no basement, so therefore, there's no conspiracy theory, which is interesting because in 2015, James Alephantis, the owner of Comet Ping Pong, as we said many times, made this statement. This is from a magazine, a Washington D.C based magazine about he had this guy uh, it was the guy that comes like, like kind of overweight with like the spiky hair he does like the food stuff he goes to different restaurants you know what i'm talking about i can't think of the guy's name guy fieri yeah that guy oh. <laughs> yeah so he came so he came to comet ping pong in 2015 and did a did did a special show about comet ping pong and interviewed alephantis well this is an interview after this um so the question is, what was it they couldn't believe you had made? Alephantis responds, well, we make everything from scratch. Other restaurants, even good restaurants, will, like, not roast their own peppers. You can just buy the roasted peppers in a can, or you can buy garlic oil. Some products you can get, and they're consistent, and they're easy. But I didn't even know that existed, actually, until they said that. Until they said that. I was like, what do you mean? There's another way? You can just buy these things because a lot of restaurants will open a can and put it on. Like our sauce, we we harvest a whole crop of organic tomatoes, 10 tons of tomatoes every year, can them all, store them in the basement, have like a harvest party when it gets loaded in, huh. <laughs> can them all, store them in the basement, quote, unquote. <laughs> so is there a basement or is there not a basement? I don't think that he cans his own tomatoes. I think that's the lie. You think that's the lie? Yeah. You may be right. <laughs> that could be true. Maybe we just caught him. That's the big conspiracy that he doesn't can his own damn tomatoes. Uh, but there's but there's a contradiction yeah, there. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. From what Stephen Colbert is said in reporting and saying that there's no basement and the elephant is in from a year before, over a year before, saying that there is a basement in Comic Pinball. 
And other people have said that, is he talking, well, is he talking about his basement at Comic Ping Pong? Is he talking about his basement at home? Is he talking about another restaurant? But all he says is store them in the basement. So you assume he's talking about the basement of the, of Comet Ping Pong, the restaurant, one of the, the restaurants that he owns. <laughs> oh, what are these kids doing here? Like, oh, well, I guess I'll like store it around them. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to read this from an email um, that I got from a guy who was talking about Thad McCracken and how, how happy he was quote unquote about him. Uh, I thought he brought up some pretty good points. Um, this is from a couple of his points about Pizzagate. It says James Alephantis is either a former or current lover of David Brock, who is a major mover and shaker in DC. He was once a conservative who rose to fame in the early nineties by writing a book on the sexual assault claims aimed at Bill Clinton. Somewhere towards the end of the nineties, he completely shifts gears and becomes a liberal working for the Clintons. He is also in charge of three organizations in bed with the Clinton Foundation, one of which is extremely sketchy and seems to be a dummy front, all of which handle mass of amounts of money, and it is believed that this is how the money gets laundered. There may not be anything connecting the Clintons to Pizzagate, but this is most definitely something connecting Alephantis to the Clintons. Pictures were released of an interior tour of John Podesta's home a while back showing exactly which painting he owns, if there aren't more, and yes, it is one of the tasteless ones with a bound child, so we do know which picture he owns. That's interesting. George Soros has donated large sums of money to Comet Ping Pong. Epstein, talking about Jeffrey Epstein, who we mentioned in the last show, is not the only known sexual predator within the Clinton inner circle by far. There was another fellow whose last name is Bean who was working for them who was caught with a child. Also, Huma Abedin is Anthony Weiner's estranged wife. Uh, more children disappear from the county surrounding Washington, D.C. in 2016 than the entire number of missing children in Texas and California. Areas of land mass and populations much larger than that of the District of Columbia. The official numbers of children returned by the organization Nexus, I believe, are totally botched, and a large amount of the missing children don't even have photos of recognition attached to their missing persons file. Julian Assange has not made a public appearance or a confirming proof of life message to the public since October, and it is rumored that he has a dead man switch in InfoDrop ready to be released with even more emails if he doesn't log into an account within a certain amount of time. Needless to say, his input would be extremely helpful right now concerning the Podesta emails and the Russian hacking story. That being said, I'm still not completely sold on the legitimacy and intentions of Assange and WikiLeaks. Well, let me. The website for the band Heavy Breathing is about as blatant as it can get with its sickness. Another rumor pedophilic term themed band that frequents Comet called Sex Stains are also featured the twisted insignia used by Besta Pizza. We talked about that. Good God. Had it only been Besta Pizza to use this symbol, I would have dismissed it as well, but it is painted very deliberately in one of their videos on a prop piece. This is interesting. The traffic cam outside Comic Ping Pong was removed 23 hours before Welch, talking about Edgar Madison Welch, who walked in there with a gun, showed up on the scene. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, here's something that doesn't make sense to me, right? One of the reasons I don't think it has much credibility. I mean, everything you were just read, I, I had heard nothing about. But it everyone... In their situations of the, of the Clintons, you know, they're all rich. They're all wealthy, right? They could travel anywhere they want, like at any time, wake up in the morning, fly anywhere in the world. Uh, well, there, there's like islands that are, that are known like islands in Thailand and stuff, you know, full of children that they can go exploit all they want to. Why would they like run the risk of that getting found out here and, and revealed and, you know, and getting into trouble for it whenever they could fly somewhere else in the world, Africa or Thailand, and go exploit children over there. If I don't know. Too. Arrogance, pride. Also could be. Or that's that, just as traceable. Also could be that you have a preference thing where, you know, maybe they don't like somebody doesn't like black children or Asian children. Yeah. They prefer white kids. I suppose. I mean, supposedly blondes in any trafficking situation usually get the most. And we've all seen the movie Taken, right? You know. Mm. 
But I mean, that there is a point to that. I mean, there is a little bit of a basis there in, in, in reality of the stuff that happens. Have so, a very yeah. specific set of skills. Yeah. I mean, I could see, I mean, I, I could see that. I mean, you never know the, the, the what, what these people can do or what they're capable of. Um, now, all that being said, I mean, I'm not entirely sure that what is going on here is is just a ped- is a pedophile ring. It could be something completely different that these people are trying to cover up. That maybe in it, there is a possibility that maybe inadvertently, all these people that are talking about Pizzagate and saying that's a pedophile ring are actually may have stumbled onto something that might be money laundering or drugs or who knows what it could be. Um, Alephantis to me is still very suspicious. Yeah, he's extremely suspicious. Okay, he's into something, and he's in deep. This is a guy who is a restaurant owner, and not to disparage restaurant owners, but he apparently is one of the top fifty people with influence in Washington D.C. What's up with that? Okay, is it just because he's such a good guy in the community? But then he has all these connections to the Clintons, and he has all the connections to John Podesta. Well, is he a former politician, retired? No. no. Oh. Either lover or ex-lover of this David Brock oh, guy. He's a pizza chef. Yeah. So he's got his hands into something. He's got his hands into something that is bad. Now, whether that's child trafficking, I don't know. But there seems to be a lot of damage control that is being done on this stuff. Right. And then you have also that the whole fake news meme has come about because primarily because of Pizzagate. And if we're going to talk about fake news, we need to talk about briefly this whole Russian hacking thing, which the only thing that I have been able to see as quote unquote proof that this Russian hacking went on, they blame the Russians for basically the WikiLeaks material, which is, uh, the first of all, the DNC documents for the Democratic National Com- Committee, right? Those documents talking about how we could, how they can, uh, you know, not get Sanders nominated, but uh, clearly Clinton nominated their strategy for doing so, the underhanded shit that they did to do it, and then also the Podesta emails, which that's what sparked off the whole Pizzagate thing, okay. Is saying that 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 is the Russians that did that. Well, you know what the source of this is, and no one's actually seen the report, except maybe the president. The source of all this is the CIA. That's the source. See, and I, <clears throat> I had heard. I don't remember what. I don't remember what network I was watching. It was on the news the other day, but it said it was talking about multiple or all. I don't remember how they phrased it. Intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. agreeing on this and then looking into it further it's the fbi is discrediting it and the cia is the only ones that are (laughs) right yeah the cia the cia has said that it is that that this is what's happened it's the russians that did it and putin's directly involved because he wants trump to be elected we've talked about this before that trump he probably does want trump to be elected he probably did not want hillary clinton you know for whatever reasons but he is saying that that's the reason, but the FBI has said, no, we don't have any proof of this. Okay. And then there's this guy, this ex British ambassador who is a friend with, uh, Julian Assange has connections to Assange. Okay. The, the founder of WikiLeaks, um, Expiration ambassador who is now a WikiLeaks operative claims Russia did not provide Clinton emails. They were handed over to him at a DC park by an intermediary for disgusted democratic insiders. This is from the daily mail from the UK. Okay. Uh, I'll read a little bit of it. A WikiLeaks envoy today claims he personally received Clinton campaign emails in Washington, DC after they were leaked by disgusted whistleblowers and not hacked by Russia. Craig Murray, former British ambassador to Uzbekistan and a close associate of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, told DailyMail.com that he flew to Washington, D.C. for a clandestine handoff with one of the email sources in September. 
Neither of the leaks came from the Russians, said Murray in an interview with DailyMail.com on Tuesday. The source had legal access to the information. The documents came from inside leaks, not hacks. His account contradicts directly the version of how thousands of Democratic emails were published before the election being advanced by U.S. intelligence. So, according to him, he got these from people that were disgusted by the course that the Democrat, the DNC, had taken because they had screwed over Bernie Sanders. These were younger people. You remember Seth Rich? Okay. Seth, Seth Rich was the guy that they found dead in D.C. Right. Uh, but they said it was a botched robbery, but there was no money taken. Right. And still no one to this day, since that happened over the summer, no one's been taken in for this crime. But uh, we played this uh, interview, the brief part of this interview, I think from the BBC, where they talked to Julian Assange. And Assange, in some ways, uh, w- was saying that he wanted to look into Seth Rich's death, who, wh- who did it, what it was. And I, and I felt like... I right. really well, felt he, like, he made a point of saying, we don't disclose our sources, right. but at the same time implying that fairly heavily implying that Mm -hmm. this happened because he was helping us expose the truth kind of thing. Yeah. He gives this, remember like they ask him about it. Like is it was, was Seth Richards, was this your source? And like, if you, well, of course we're audio, so you can't see this, but I made the point that Assange just kind of gives this slight little nod. Very affirmative body thing. Yeah. And it was almost just like, okay, to me, I was like, I think he just confirmed that possibility that Seth Rich was, could have, have been actually one of the leakers i think there was more than one according to this craig murray guy that says that he was handed this so this whole idea about the russians being uh, the, the hacked emails i think is total bullshit and you know i really trust the cia i trust everything they say yeah yeah they're more they're um, you know <laughs> they've proven themselves as <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And people will say, well, that was Bush and Cheney that did that. But the CIA signed off on it and said that, oh, yeah, they're there. Um, you know, and, and but at the, at the obverse of that, the CIA probably might have a good idea of how to rig elections because they they do it all the time. They did it in 1948 in Italy to keep the communists from coming to power. That's historically proven. So maybe they know a thing or two about how the you know, how the Russians actually did it. And Pot just calling the kettle black. Just, just to give a counterpoint here, we talked about this before the the show a little bit. Is that I hadn't had a chance to look into this as deeply as I wanted to, but uh, it's it is easy to buy because there's definitely a motive there, you know. And you got Putin, sure. who's former KGB. You know, he, who obviously stands to benefit way more from a, a Trump presidency than a Hillary presidency. And I don't know if that just makes him an easy target or if that's that's a motive and something to look into. But yeah, well, yeah, it could be. But even if the Russians did do it, even if they did, even if the Russians said, yeah, we hacked. So what? Even if they did, that doesn't change the fact that you've got the, these emails where it pretty much lays out the strategy to exclude Bernie Sanders from ever getting the nominations and the dirty tricks that the Democrats <laughs> pulled. Well, so it's like so. And the, the other email that that um, talked about promoting uh, conservative extremists like Trump and Ted Cruz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That which you can you can see that whole thing play right, out as well. Yeah, good point. Because that was going to be the easiest person for Hillary, because even in the Mm -hmm. email, it said um, back then, like, these are the people that Hillary is most likely to be able to beat. So let's promote them being the Republican Mm -hmm. candidates. And it sure as hell didn't work out that way, did it? No, it didn't. (laughs) It backfired. It backfired big time. And that's, you know, and and I, and that's a whole other issue. But yeah, Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, Luke said something bad about you, Rob. Okay. And <laughs> yeah. And I find out I find out states. about it. I found <laughs> out about it, right? And I tell you, okay? And then you look at me and you like, "Damn, you do. Why, you know, like you uh, like this is your fault. Why did you tell me this?" You know, <laughs> I like you. Why did you tell I, me I, that? I hate you now. Why did you ruin it? It's just kill the messenger. 
but yeah, I mean, that's how it is. And so don't, I, I really think that this is just, like I said, the, I think this is the last gasp of, of the Obama administration trying to keep some kind of control going. It'll be interesting to see like the, uh, relationship between Trump and the CIA after this though, because tr- Trump has come out and said basically the CIA are lying. So we're going to have another Kennedy situation in this country. That's going to be interesting. Well, and that's the other thing that I heard on the news the other day was that, you know, he's calling out the very agencies he's going to be relying on in a few mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. Well, we all know he has a big mouth anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, uh, one thing. Uh, we had uh, a little bit of a discussion about 20 minutes long with Joshua about Mari and apparitions. Um, and some of the things that he had studied about it and some of the ways that I felt about it and, and Rob felt about it as well. Uh, you can only get that discussion if you are a Patreon. So if you have signed up for Patreon in the time that, uh, whatever that is you're hearing this, you will receive that discussion about Marian apparitions with Joshua Cutchin. And by the way, that's, uh, patreon.com slash conspiranormal. As and there's with an I. links on our website at www.conspiranormal.com slash Patreon. Mm-hmm. And you can also donate as well if you don't want to become a Patreon, and that's on the website as well. So, But we do, rec- yeah, we do recommend the Patreon because you can become part of our community, and we're going to start mm-hmm. having monthly Skype discussions with, right. with our, you know, all of our followers. And you can post stuff on there. We can post stuff. We can communicate. It's just an easier forum for all of us to sort of get together. And if you give $1,000, you can have a date with Luke. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Anything goes too. <laughs> <laughs> Luke has no shame, so that's True. that's that's all good. And, and you get to pick the mankini I wear for the night. Too. <laughs> all right, guys, on the next show, and actually, we're going to be calling our next guest in about two minutes. But uh, we got Doctor Future coming back on, and we're going to talk about the year of, that was in 2016. Some of the things that he feels that are important right now, and we are also going to do our year in review. So, guys, please join us next time as we continue. To close out 2016, and by the way, Merry Christmas to everybody out there. Hope you have a <laughs> good, offensive. solid one. Yeah, happy holidays. Yeah, yeah happy holidays. <laughs> so we want to be, well, hey, Trump's bringing Christmas back, okay? <laughs> All right. He's bringing Christmas back. We can say Merry Christmas now. This is Trump's America, damn it. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to be beholden to this He doesn't have my support fascism. anymore then. I'm, I'm dropping out. I'm dropping out. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> okay. Festival, Festival of Lights. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back on Conspiranormal. Conspiranormal.